Good morning. Matt, uh, Larry and Wayne. Yeah, Larry first and then Wayne. <coughs> if, if you'll get your uh, announcements out and just turn to Peace Colloquy and Peace Award, and I'm going to read it in one moment, but uh, before I do, I never uh, measure success based on attendance. But let me ask you, was it great to see a full sanctuary for the colloquy? Was it great? Uh, for those of you who weren't able to be here, the, uh, uh, there wasn't a vacant seat in the sanctuary. The, the only vacant seat were uh, in the choir loft and Sheila and I and a couple other people were there. We, uh, I know we handed out, uh, and we'll talk about that, Billy, thank you. Uh, I want to thank, by the way, Billy. I was noticing uh, when Billy noticed everybody coming in, Billy got up and, and went into action and was, was helping greeting and seating, so, uh, so thanks to all of you. Uh, it, was, uh, it was awesome. Uh, whether, even if we just had a handful of people, the, the service, the singing, the, the reception were, uh, would have been a great success. Uh, the, the three past recipients, Lewis, Dr. Lemuel, and uh, Sister Deborah Kennedy, all uh, thanked me after the service for being invited and all three of them used one word. They all used one word, and that was the word privilege. Uh, they all told me it was, a, it was a privilege to be a part of the, uh, the peace colloquy. So thank you. Sheila and I want to especially thank four people who put a lot of time in. And number one is John. Uh, he's not listening to me, but he put a lot of time in. Uh, uh, we sent out a uh, hundred of these beautiful invitations. John printed them. We handed out close to 200 of these beautiful uh, programs. John printed them. We gave the Pride of Mobile a beautiful plaque and John, with the help of uh, David Jr., produced that plaque. Uh, John, they probably saved us five, six, seven hundred dollars by doing that. So thanks, John. I want to thank uh, Joyce. We gave the Pride of Mobile, the members, we gave each one of them one of these beautiful hand towels. Uh, Joyce came up with the idea and she made all 25 of these hand towels. So Joyce, thank you. So that was a... And want to thank Ann Rose. Now Ann, uh, for each, all, for all of our coll colloquies, Ann has come up. She has created a original artwork and the the artwork this year was amazing amazing for those of you who weren't able to be here uh, Anne had the artwork displayed where the little pulpit was and during the first part of the service it was veiled but when she uh, when she presented it to the pride of mobile she unveiled it and those of you who were here know what happened what happened just oohs and eyes. Literally, uh, people who were on the front row and who saw it, they were just ooing and eyeing. It was really spectacular. So, so thank you, Anne. And uh, once again, thanks to the Griffins, the, uh, the Griffins, the whole family put a lot of time in getting the facilities ready. Uh, the Boy Scouts uh, took care of parking and they uh, participated in the flag program. So tell Rick and to all of the Griffins, thank you. Uh, be sure and watch it on the web. And uh, Al was our photographer, and after the first of the year, we'll, we'll get together, look at pictures, and relive the colloquy. Now, last Sunday, the Community of Christ was the center, the heart of the Christian community of Mobile. Almost 200 Christians from many different churches singing, let there be peace on earth, and promising to be peacemakers.
truly we shared the peace of Christ and thanks to all. To all you priesthood that are here and to those that you might see this afternoon, I'll just remind them this afternoon at 2 o'clock we will have a priesthood meeting for all priesthood. That's all priesthood. Hopefully that you received a letter this past week. Uh, they gave you, you know, that, that word that you fitted into your schedule this afternoon. Um, I sincerely would appreciate your attendance. Uh, it's very important. It's probably the last opportunity we're going to have that before we get into the holiday season to meet. So it's, uh, please make every effort that you can to be here this afternoon. Be on time, please, so we can get started at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Golf Mission Center is having their hymn sing this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Uh, Barbara asked me to encourage you all to attend. There will be refreshments afterwards. Also, she asked me to, for all the priesthood members, uh, there will be a uh, dinner that's in the bulletin. Uh, the cost has come to $15, which includes the gratuity. Senior luncheon is this coming Thursday at 1030. And that, uh, have we decided what, what the luncheon's going to be yet, Helen? Okay, surprise. I like surprises. Uh, as you know, the men's club's having Boston Butt fundraiser. Uh, Rick needs to know, if you haven't turned it into him already, he needs to know your count of what you plan on buying. Uh, now. By tomorrow, need it now. And uh, Thanksgiving dinner is next Sunday at, after church. Bring your favorite vegetables, salads, and desserts. Be sure and read over the uh, Christmas events of uh, about the hanging of the green, the children's program, which also include a congregational fellowship service part, Christmas Eve service, which. Uh, Wayne will be presiding over. And now I want to get to the people things in our church. Oh. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Start off with uh, Alice Franklin had some follow-up procedures done Monday. She's doing good to be expected. And that uh, Jerry's shaking her head no, that she's having problems, I guess. And that uh, she, uh, Jerry, you want to elaborate? Any? Oh, Betty Rester, she's doing good. And that uh, she's in good spirits. Uh, part of you that have emails, I sent e email out about David. Uh, David's in intensive care. It was a uh, something the doctors wanted so that he could have one-on-one -on -one with a nurse attending to him. 
they went to do some procedures on Friday and uh, had some problems and so they put him in intensive care. Uh, Louise and I went to see him yesterday afternoon. Uh, he's still communicating the best he can with uh, tubes down his throat and in his nose and that. Uh, uh, I noticed when we first got there I went on his left side and he always wants to grab your hand and I was holding his hand and there but I noticed his right hand underneath the sheet it was moving and I pulled it back and he was waving at Louise and uh, uh, I kind of missed uh, saying bye to him yesterday because every time that I've been to see him he always says God bless you and I love you and uh, he wasn't able to say that, but we said it to him, and he really squeezed my hand hard. Uh, all these people need our constant prayers. And that, uh, are there any others that, um, I, I think Charles has had his foot surgery and honor as ever. All right, that was Mary Day had her surgery on her leg. Jennifer? Right, Jennifer said Ty is his name, and and uh, and that from uh, cerebral palsy camp, and that, and keep him in your prayers too. Okay, Sheila. Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this worship service this morning. And certainly, uh, as we prepared to come out of the uh, office, we uh, kept you, the congregation, in our prayers uh, as well, that we would uh, together unite under the spirit that brings us together and be blessed by that spirit as we attend and as we hear and join in the worship service. I'd like to welcome uh, Brother Jimmy Goff and his wife Marge and their grandson Liam to the congregation this morning. Brother Jimmy is going to bring our, our message. Uh, most of you know uh, Jimmy and Marge. They're from Van Cleve, uh, worshiping the congregation there. And Jimmy was... Uh, very important to us back in 2005 when we had our congregational blessing he was the uh, part of that and provided the congregational blessing for the children and youth in the congregation and I appreciate him for that and the spirit that uh, was resident that day as we met together so I look forward to worshiping with Jimmy and Marge and Liam today and uh, our theme for this morning 
is give your all. And there are obviously many ways that we can look at that theme. Uh, we certainly have to consider our own commitment uh, as we consider that theme. But the, the verses in the scriptures that say something special to me about that is uh, that account from Matthew, which uh, I will read in your hearing now, and you can follow along in your bulletin. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May God bless us as we continue our worship with the use of NS3 as we gather. We'll sing this through one time. Stand please. Father, we come before your throne this morning seeking that that spirit will continue to be with us even as we have experienced it thus far. And we pray and hold up to this, you, this congregation, for that continuing spirit along with the one that will be responsible for bringing the message. And we pray for him. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Friday, there was an assembly at Mitchell School to honor the veterans of our country, and the students were asked to invite a veteran in their life so they could be honored, and he invited his grandfather. It was a very moving program, especially one part when the school chorus sang a medley of songs, and when they sang each song representing each branch of service, they asked those veterans that had served in that branch to stand. We also learned about something called the Veterans Flight. World War II veterans are flown from the Mobile Airport very early in the morning to Washington and spend the day visiting war memorials. They visit the tomb of the unknown soldier, witness the changing of the guards, and even participate in a ceremony there. The long emotional day ends with their plane landing in Mobile and they are greeted with a huge crowd of people cheering them on and welcoming them home. These trips are made possible by donations, and it costs $500 to send one veteran on a flight. The past couple of weeks, the sixth graders at Mitchell School, in honor of Veterans Day, were asked to give up a snack from the candy cart at school, or a small token they would n normally buy, to donate a dollar or so to the veteran flight program. Their goal was $1,000 to send two veterans to Washington. They not only exceeded their goal, but they surpassed it. 
and the day of the assembly presented a check for $1,100 to Dr. Barry Booth toward this cause. I was impressed by the fact that for many small donations, a very large gift could be made toward a very worthy cause. And we also gave just a few dollars, and I felt so proud to feel like I had played a part in presenting that check that day. Because of everyone's effort, two veterans would be able to take that very special journey to Washington. So let us remember that when we all give together, even if our gift is small, we can make a big difference. Would the ushers please come forward? Heavenly Father, please help us to give freely of the gifts that have been given to us. Please bless the money we receive to do your work and help in the building of your kingdom. Amen. Let's pray for peace. Holy Spirit, Lord and life giver, divine presence, divine power, divine wisdom, divine life, divine love. Gracious Spirit, come, we pray into our lives. Help us to walk by faith as Abraham and Sarah did. Form in us the peace which passes understanding. Become in us a well of living water, and so quench the thirst of our hearts. Heal us of self-centeredness that we may freely turn toward our neighbors and our enemies. Break us of pride that the love of Christ may have place in us. 
Intercede for us, for we are weaker than we dare to think. Remake us that our lives may give to our weary world a glimpse of God's kingdom. Sanctify all God's people that they may work for righteousness and justice. Fill us with the joy of heaven that we may do your will on earth. Fit us for service now and prepare us for the life of the age to come. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. For some of you that may not know me, I'm Jim Goff from Van Cleve, Mississippi. I appreciate being invited to come and to share with you today. I was beginning to wonder uh, exactly what was going on when George got up and he said we was back in the back and we was praying for the congregation out here, so I don't know if he was referring to me or, or to whom. First thing I asked him, did they have one of these things you can put on me that I can walk around and talk and they said it wasn't working. I said, do you have a mic that I could hold? And they said, no, you got to stand behind the pulpit. Well, it's hard for me to stay here, so if I move away from the speaker and you can't hear, tell me to get back, okay? Because I move all over the stage usually when I'm talking. I selected a couple of scriptures for us to consider as we think about the theme and also how it relates to our individual lives. When I received from George the outline of the service, God works in so many different ways. He had chosen one of the scriptures that I was going to use, and so I will use it later in the service. But also, when I sit here and listen to all of the announcements and the things that the church is involved in, that is what I'm going to talk about today, about giving our all and being involved. In the book of Luke, it says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. After Christ had read this to the congregation, he then said, 
this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. If you read those scriptures in Luke, you'll see that he said some other things and some people got upset. But from that moment on, Christ started his ministry and his ministry was based upon this scripture that he read. If you see all of the things that he was involved in, Christ was doing this ministry and bringing this gospel into the lives of people. So Christ began his ministry, applying the gospel into the everyday happenings of everyday life. And so many of his parables, he reached out and took an event that happened that was something they did every day, of the person sowing the seed, of the woman dropping a coin into the to collection when the other stood up in the front and dropped big coins in, made sounds so everybody could see that they're doing, but she quietly put hers in. He talked about the vineyard, he talked about the field, he talked about the harvest. All of those things that people were involved in their daily life, he used this as parables to teach the gospel to the people. Martin Luther said, and I'm not quoting, I'm paraphrasing, that the gospel is not only in the scriptures, but in the trees, and in the flowers, and in the clouds, and in the stars. And so the gospel is in every facet of our life. And how we live, and how we react or how we act to the situations in our lives daily makes the gospel become real and alive in the things that we do. Think about your concept of the gospel. What is your concept of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus in his real life was being confronted by so many people at his time trying to trick him or to snag him into committing a transgression of the law. They would ask him many questions. They would ask him about situations to see how he would respond so that they might be able to catch him as he Transgress one of the laws that they had. They asked him many questions. This time when he was among them, they asked him about a married man with six brothers. And they said, what happens if he dies and then his widow, by law and custom, marries the next brother? And then he dies, and then she marries the next one. Then he dies, on down to the last one. Then they asked, to whom would be her husband after the resurrection? Waiting for Jesus to respond to the question they had asked. Jesus answered and said, you do not know the scriptures concerning the resurrection. You neither marry or give in marriage in the resurrection. And then he said, you have not read that which is given to you. God said, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Sometimes we want to worship the God of the dead rather than the God of the living. God calls us as individuals, God calls us as a church, God calls us as couples to move into areas that we're not even comfortable with so that we might grow, so that we might be able to see a perspective different than what we hold on to and say this is the way it's going to be and that's nothing going to change. the last world conference 
we had a young man to stand up and bear testimony. He had come in contact with some people that taught him about Jesus Christ. And through the Spirit, he was converted to Jesus Christ. Then he came in contact with the community of Christ. And he became a member and became a, a priesthood member and then became a pastor of a congregation. But in the part of Africa that he was from, there was the law and the custom of that day and time, in this day and time also, that if your brother dies, you marry his wife, and you take her, even though you may be married, and you raise them children as your own. And if she doesn't have any sons, you try to produce a son, so that would be raised in his name. And so the family came to him and said, we want you to marry his widow. And he says, I can't do that. Now can you imagine the strain that was upon him and his family and the ministry that he was trying to provide as a church to his family of the new Christ that he had found the church that he had found, and went against everything that he had been taught that was the law. And the custom of that tribe that he lived in. He had to make a very hard and difficult decision. And he made it. And it caused a big rift with him and his family, but he was spending time trying to bring some community and some communication and some love and some understanding between him and his family. So the same situation that they were bringing to Christ at that time exists today. And Christians are facing it in many of the different countries that they live in. It's actually happening in life. The gospel is real. The gospel is touching lives of people. In the same time that they had tempted Jesus, then a lawyer tempted him, saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And from the reading that I had done, the commandments and the laws at that day and time, there were 613. Now, can you imagine trying to make sure that you never did one of those 613 things that was listed as laws and commandments. And they had people in that day and time who would go around and that's all they did was to make sure that people didn't break one of these laws. And so they wanted to know, of all the 613, what is the greatest commandment? And as George read, Jesus said, the Lord our God is one God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he said, On these two commandments, of all the 613, but on these two, hang all the laws and prophets. And if I understand what Jesus was saying, if they don't measure up to this, that you love God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, then there shouldn't be a commandment there. That this is what we measure the commandments and the laws by. is love. Not condemnation. The world today stands in the need of a Savior. It doesn't stand in the need of condemnation. And in our everyday life, we have opportunity to give the difference to the people that we meet. When it said to love God with all your heart, what did he mean? He's not talking about this organ in here that's pumping blood that we call the heart. He's talking about you, your being. What makes you you? What makes you different than other people? Your inner self. 
that that is what he's saying I want you to love God with. When he said love him with all your soul, and the scriptures tells us that the body and the spirit makes us up the soul of mankind, then he's saying I want you to love him with all of your body and all of your, your spirit. That those two things, committed to loving God, and what do you think he meant when he says to love him with all of your mind? He's talking about your will and your intelligence. In fact, the scriptures tells us that the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth, and light and truth for sake of that evil one. He told us very early in the restoration movement that he's not going to give everything to us, that we need to use our mind, that we need to, to use those gifts that he has given us and to make decisions on our own, but to rely upon his spirit to guide us and direct us. I can remember when women were called in the priesthood, when the revelation come and Marge and I was at World Conference. I struggled with that. But I can remember the day I woke up when we were going to vote and I went over there and I had the greatest peace that God had ever given me to vote. You know what Margie said? Margie says, why did it take us so long and why did God have to give us a revelation for us to come to this understanding? We have a mind and we have intellect. Why couldn't we have come that upon our own? Sometimes we want God to give us the direction for everything. I remember one time a woman bore a testimony and she says, I don't do anything. I don't even sweep my floor unless God tells me to do it. Sometimes we get that way. We want God to tell us to do everything. When God expects us to make decisions, God expects us to make choices, God expects us to use that which he has given us to bring ministry and love into the world. So the gospel is commandments. But more than that, this gospel is lived in loving response to God's love. And this is what Christ was trying to say. That we respond to God's love. And this is what the gospel is all about. It's not saying you got to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. And if you keep those commandments, then that's what the gospel is. What did Christ do? He was walking through the cornfield with his disciples. And they were hungry. And it was the Sabbath. They plucked corn. And they were said, you can't do that. That's against the law. And Christ says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So even Christ saying that love overrules those things that we must extend God's love to those that sometimes we refuse to extend it to. When we're selfish with the gospel that God has given us. So the gospel is commandments, but it's more than this. The gospel is lived in loving response to God's love. And if we look at our everyday lives, we can see God working through us and in others in the very basic things we do. Quickly, I'd like to tell you about a couple of people real quick that happened within our congregation. Alvin and Geraldine had three children. They decided to have another child, and the child was born mentally and physically disabled. She was the youngest child, and so... Geraldine and her family devoted themselves 
to this child. The doctor said she wouldn't live very long, but I think she lived to be up to about 17, 19. We were called many times to go over and to administer to her that she might be able to have God's spirit to be with her and bless her. After she passed away, Geraldine for 19 years had really not been able to, to hardly do anything outside of the house. And so after a while, she decided she wanted to do something, so she decided she'd go to work. And she found offers of two jobs, and she come to prayer service, and she asked that we pray that whatever job that God would think that she would really be able to be of service at, that she would have it. So she took the job with the youth court at the detention center, cooking as a cook's helper. She worked there quite a few years. She got to meeting the workers there and different things they would do, and, and she would not participate in their activities. And, and she would say, I'll pray for you. And, and they began to question her about things in their life that wasn't right and said, why do you not do those things? She said, because of my church. And they'd go again, and then she'd say, no, I can't do that. We don't do that. That's not right. Why? Because of my church. Then one day, one of them said, would you teach us about your church? She said, I'll talk to my husband. So she talked to Alvin, and he talked to Terry Gladnier. And they set up a cottage meeting with this family. And they went through the slides and, and with them. Alvin had a sort of a problem with black people. He worked with them, but he just never did want to get too close. So here he was going into this home of black people. And one night they were, had a big supper fixed and they were getting ready for their cottage meetings and he was standing there and there was a young lady at the food over here and Alvin just felt the urge to go give her a hug. He said, I can't do that. In a few minutes they walked over to each other and they gave each other the biggest hug you've ever seen. He didn't know it, but this young lady said, I never want a white man to ever touch me. But in that experience, because they moved out and went to that home, that was taken away. And then every time they go to a cottage meeting, Alvin said he hugged everybody in there. And they hugged him. Neighbors started coming. And the room kept getting fuller and fuller. The next thing you knew, the cottage meeting was over. And they said, what do we do next? And they said, well, we can be and talk about the Lord, or we can do this. They said, well, some people come in late, so let's go through those cottage meetings again. So they went through it a second time. They were so thrilled to find the gospel presented in a way that made something real to them. That they could apply to their life. That they could understand and comprehend. After they went through the second time, and they began to go visit in the home, the next thing they said, we want to be baptized. So we had a baptism at my house. We have a swimming pool. Five people were baptized. Now we have priesthood over there. We have a church that they, are, they have bought a church trying to get it, a building to make it into a church. They're moving forward because... Geraldine took the simple things of life and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've told you all about Sonny Hilton once before. He was 89 when we come in contact with him. All because somebody asked somebody to take some medicine by his house. And they found his trailer in such disarray that they wanted to fix it. They asked some more of us to come. The congregation in Van Cleve took up money. We repaired the trailer for him. 
and he would then could take his scooter and go down and visit his neighbors. And they kept asking, what, what church is doing that? He said, I don't know. He said, they never told me. They didn't wear a t-shirt tell them who they were. They were people that just come here and, and did all the repairs and did all the services that, because it was needed. So one day he asked me what church, and I told him. And he started writing a little check to contribute to the church. Marge and I was on vacation. We were in the Rocky Mountains. Yellowstone. She said, we were in Yellowstone. I received a phone call from Justin. He said, I need to talk to you about Sonny. I said, oh, no, he's passed away. He said, no. He said, he wants to be baptized. He said, when he passes away, he wants you to do his funeral. So I said, when we get home, we've already got a baptism planned. So contact him and tell him. So we come home, and he was baptized. He's 92 now. He'll be 93 in February. Still lives by himself. Still cooks. And he testifies everywhere he goes about the love of God. Because of him, we got involved with the Samaritan Ministries in Ocean Springs. It's led to so many other ways that our church is involved. We contribute money. We're doing like y'all do. We're, we volunteer the second week of every month to uh, help give out food. We take, bring clothes down there for them. Our church got involved because we took him down there to get food and found out that they needed some more help. And so it keeps expanding. It keeps expanding. The gospel is real. If we look at those everyday things that we do, and we don't become judgmental, but we become loving, and we offer the people the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Was this not what Christ was talking about? There is such great need in the world, in our country, in our communities, in our homes, in our individual lives. This is where Jesus said to minister. This is where Jesus ministered to when he was here. Let us each look of how through God and Christ how he can open up avenues for us to minister and say, here am I, Lord, send me. May God bless you. May the activities that you're involved in, may they be expanded. May your workforce be expanded. May you invite. May people respond. And may we do God's will here on earth. Thank you. We'll sing this twice for emphasis.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come this day. We're glad we came. For you have blessed us with your Holy Spirit. You have looked into our hearts. And Father, you know which way we should go. We thank you for the love that you give us. And we thank you for all that will come in the future. Because you always love. Father, I pray that you will bless this people with your love in the name of Jesus Christ. That you will bless this people with the Holy Spirit for strength and that positive love that keeps us going. We do ask this blessing for this congregation and we ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.